and uh, children were so cooperative. The volunteers put in so much time. If you have a chance and you walk downstairs, you're walking underwater because you'll look up and see the waves above you with sea creatures there. We just had a really wonderful week together. Well, when using the Revised Common Lectionary, the preacher has choices each week about which passage she or he will use as the text. And even though we've heard from various passages through the voices of those on the preaching rotation in the last few weeks, have you noticed that the gospel readings have been this very long discourse looking at Jesus as the bread of life? Five weeks we have been hearing about Jesus as the bread of life, culminating with today's section of John 6. Now, five weeks is a significant amount of time to dedicate to one theme. So that alone merits our attention. It's a little nudge. Listen to what God has for us. Jesus here teaches us in ways that confuse, mystify, offend, and even anger his listeners. And at the end of the day, he loses not only his opponents, but many of those who called themselves disciples and followed him. So if we get out our WWJD bracelets, you know, what would Jesus do? And consider that seriously, then you could be in trouble today for what I would try to do. <laughs> but I promise I'm not trying to offend, and I'm not trying to anger, and I certainly don't want you to leave. But if I did that, if I preached that the way that Jesus had preached this, then we would look at the exit doors as the most important doors in the service today. But here, this morning, we have a table set, and we breathe a little sigh of relief that we found a way to interpret this passage that domesticates gnawing on flesh, which is a more literal translation of Jesus' words here, and of drinking blood. We have a consecrated wafer and a small sip of juice, and we're done. <laughs> but we will never experience the full and intended impact of Scripture unless we try to imagine what those present in the narratives were feeling, thinking, acting upon as they heard those messages for the first time. So just for a moment, Let's set aside our sacramental theology that we have learned so well and place ourselves in this scene. We've heard several times over the last few months a theme of abide in Christ. But here Jesus equates abiding not with an agricultural type of metaphor like vine and branches, but with flesh and blood integrated into who we are ingested. Is it any wonder that those who were there murmured and questioned among themselves, what does this mean? Is he even sane? I'm sure some of them thought. There was no table to point to with a sigh of relief. There was no bread, no common cup, or in COVID times here, no individual cups to understand. There was just Jesus in front of them offering his flesh and his blood for consumption. I have the unique pleasure of First Communion uh, preparation classes, or I have had that for the last few years for some of the children here at COS. And two things always strike me when I set out to do that. The first is that though it's a privilege, it's a little daunting, because how do you demystify the mystery of Christ offering us his very flesh and blood for our salvation. And then secondly, the children in their somewhat literal stage of thinking get it. They get what those first people would have thought when they heard this. And sometimes a yuck follows. Yuck! When they find out this is what we're talking about. Well, yuck is exactly what some of those present in our Bible story said and thought. Jesus' teaching stretched or attempted to stretch the listeners' imaginations out of their preconceived, limited understanding of who he was 
and God's purposes through his life, death, and resurrection. Some of the ways he stretched. People came to him, well, Moses gave us manna in the wilderness. Can you do that? Could we have manna again? And Jesus stretched that. Those who ate that manna died. He said, my flesh is bread unto eternal life. Solomon dedicates the temple, asking God to fill it with his presence. And he asks the question, can God really dwell on earth? And Jesus stretches the imagination by saying, something greater than the temple is here in your midst. God really can dwell on the earth and did so in the incarnate Christ. In Exodus, we read of the Passover being instituted, a slain lamb, blood on the doorposts, and a meal eaten for freedom. And Jesus enacts the Passover in his very flesh, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, slain for us. All of these and more are interpreted more deeply and broadly when we interpret them through Christ. All of those in the Old Testament are but shadows of the reality of what Christ would bring. However, not everyone can give up their little boxes of understanding and organization so easily. So first his opponents left in disgust. And then... Many who followed him also left. And then there are the 12 apostles in front of him, and Jesus turns to them to ask them, and what about you? Do you also wish to go away? And Peter replies for them all, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, Peter sometimes can be annoying to me. I Maybe to you too, I don't know. He's kind of brash, he's kind of braggy, he's boisterous, he's unsteady. But here, he's beautiful. Such a beautiful expression. Beautiful because it doesn't appear that they really understood what Jesus meant either. And yet, there was a willingness to set aside what they thought they knew and to open themselves to mystery that they would need to grow into to follow Christ. They didn't wait until they had it all together and understood. They opened their hearts to mystery. And we need to do that as well because I don't think any of us have it all together in our understanding it's always enlarging before us. It's always growing bigger before us. So embracing mystery is the key. Empiricism, as much of our culture depends upon, can never fully explain the things of God. Even our language cannot bear the weight, the description of holy things. God comes down from heaven to us, we could never reach up to him. Our understanding would never, our, never take us on that path of salvation. Only Christ coming to us, being sent by the Father. And here we are centuries later with the advantage of the canonized scripture and the writing of so many astute and faithful theologians and past, pastors, Christian thinkers, but we still need God to break open our limited understanding in our hearts of who God is and how God acts. And like Peter, we need to confess that we have nowhere else to go even when we don't understand exactly where we are. There is no one else to go to, no one but God through Christ, the word of eternal life. The table still has mystery for us. How God nourishes us in Christ here is beyond our limited intellectual abilities to understand. But somehow God meets us here with spiritual food and drink. 
our daily bread that we pray for is indeed Christ. Give us this day our daily bread. Not just physical food to keep us alive, but the daily bread of Christ for eternal life. Last week, Joseph ended his uh, preaching by asking us to think about what we wished for. Just as Solomon was asked by God, what can I give you? Joseph, Joseph put it out to us, what would you say if God came to you and asked that? There's a wish or a desire that's been on my heart for a long time that I'd like to share with you. And that is, I wish I could be hungrier. Not hungrier for physical food, because that seems to be happening on its own. But, <laughs> but hungrier for God. And the grace also that God might give to me to help me make others hungry in their pursuit of God. My greatest joy would, to be, or would be to see a very hungry people flocking to God's house to be fed the living bread. American life is so often like a post-Thanksgiving meal, really. It's so full, there's little room for another bite. And we doze in our fullness. A Thanksgiving nap is a tradition because you've eaten too much, right? But our lives here are so full of activity and entertainment and success and goals and toys and addictions that there's little room left for hunger. There's not room for the bread of life that gives sustenance for today and eternity to follow. So I pray for hunger for us all. That's my wish. I pray for a willingness to stay with God in the mystery, to not give up when we don't understand, or God's purposes come to us as hard words, or through others, hard circumstances or situations that we cannot hear God in. I pray for our very small ideas of God to be expanded by God's loving graces. And may our hunger lead us to this table. Now, normally, in digestion, the food consumed must be broken down from its original form until that original form is lost completely and just the nutrients are taken out of it and the waste passes into our system. But spiritual nourishment is different. We who take this meal, this body, and the blood are integrated into the reality of Christ and whom all things hold together. So to commune is not to consume in the regular sense of the word. It's actually anti-consumption, but to be taken up into participation with Christ, much larger than ourselves, yet in a mystical paradox, our true identity is secured as a hungry child is fed. I pray that you'll be hungry. I pray that I will be hungry. And I pray that the taste that we take of this world's blessings and good things will not overshadow or eclipse the hunger that we have for Christ, the true bread of life. Not the kind of bread that you eat and die, but the bread of life that is eternal. Lord, give us a hunger.